Olá, boa noite a todas e a todos. É, Bem-vindos em mais uma aula aberta da pós-graduação em paisagem ecológico. É, lembrando que a pós-graduação em paisagem ecológico da PUC Rio é, está na sua quarta turma, agora com formato online. É, ela foi concebida por eu e a Cecília Herzog, que está aqui juntinho. E é uma pós-graduação que reúne seis departamentos da. Da, da Faculdade de puc -Rio, da Faculdade de Universidade da, da PUC-Rio, é, Engenharia, Arquitetura e Urbanismo, Biologia, Geografia, Ciências Sociais, Direito, entre outros. Temos professores convidados das federais e professores convidados internacionais, como hoje, por exemplo, o time que é aqui com a gente. Está é, sendo gravado, vai para o YouTube depois, né? a gente vai colocar isso no YouTube. Se tem... É, normalmente ninguém aparece na câmera, só que realmente intervém, é, mas podendo correr o risco de alguém aparecer, mas se vocês se incomodarem, desligam, mas a gente prefere muito mesmo ver vocês, estar tá olho no olho, isso fica uma coisa mais humana e mais presente. Né? Quero aproveitar para agradecer o Rodrigo e a Amanda do CICE, que dão apoio institucional às nossas aulas, e hoje também agradecer o André e a Soraya, que vão fazer a tradução, né, que estão aqui pra, com a gente. Eu aproveito para explicar que hoje no Zoom deve aparecer para vocês lá embaixo um pequeno globo né, escrito em interpretação e vocês ali podem é, escolher a língua que vocês querem escutar. Né, se vocês botam português, vocês vão escutar a, a palestra do time traduzida já. Né, e tem um, inclusive um sistema para poder cortar o áudio original e somente escutar a faixa em português. Muito obrigado a todos por estar presentes. Como sempre, convido vocês a se apresentarem no chat aí, nome, instituição de origem, local de origem, o que mais vocês sentirem vontade de se, de se apresentar, para a gente se conhecer, a gente está no ambiente mais aconchegante aqui. Eu desejo a todo mundo uma boa aula e passo a palavra aqui a Cecília. Boa aula a todos. Muito obrigado. É, assim, uma, muita, tô, tô muito feliz, né, hoje, é, quem tá recebendo o Tim Bitley e vocês, né? Então, mais uma aula aberta aqui da, da pós, que nem o Pierre falou, né? É, não sei se vocês conhecem, me conhecem e conhecem o Pierre, né? Nós dois somos paisagistas, a gente nunca se apresenta, <risos> mas hoje me lembraram no, no papo anterior, né? a gente não se apresenta muito bem, mas enfim, nós dois somos paisagistas, é, e a gente tem um foco urbano bastante assim, é, pronunciado, né? e é, por isso a gente montou esse ciclo, que é o ano passado a gente já teve dois ciclos, esse ano a gente está com mais esse ciclo de palestras, são dez, a gente tem a honra de ter, além do Tim Bitley aqui com a gente hoje, if you can open your camera, Tim, it would be great. É, tem o Fabiano Lemes, que está aqui, ele vai fazer a já veio ver como é que é, né? Veio aproveitar essa... Ele vai estar com a gente é, na semana que vem, não. Semana que vem, né, é, Fábio? Acho que você está sem... Você não pode abrir o microfone, mas acho que é a semana que vem é o Fabiano, né? Ele, vai, ele é do Politécnico de Milão, atualmente, professor lá, e é, é um craque nessa área de impressora verde, é, enfim... E aí, no final, a gente vai botar o pôsterzinho dele também, é, para convidar todo mundo, mas já que ele está presente, a gente já agradece a presença dele também. É, Tim Bitley é uma pessoa, assim, é, incrível, ele tem, não sei, eu, eu tenho, eu tenho possivelmente umas, é, uns oito livros dele, é, eu não sei quantos livros ele tem no total, porque eu não tenho todos, então acredito que ele tenha mais livros do que eu, os que eu tenho, então ele é um, um autor muito muito rico, né? ele é, é o criador da rede Cidades Biofílicas, da qual eu faço parte, e que o Rio de Janeiro vai entrar também, em breve, está né? aplicando, e eu acho que até o time pode explicar isso melhor, porque ele que está em contato agora com a com a pessoa da prefeitura encarregada, eu fiz a ponte e a pessoa está... É, é. E espero que outras cidades brasileiras também se animem a entrar na rede de cidades biofílicas. E uh, brasileiras ou não, pode ser Milão também, né, Fabiano? Pode <risos> animar Milão também a entrar na rede. E quem for tiver é, é, 
Petrópolis, a Raquel, estou vendo aqui, então mais ou menos identifico algumas pessoas que eu já sei de onde são, né? assim, motivando a, a, os locais. Eu vou pedir para todo mundo colocar, como sempre, o seu nome, é, a sua filiação, é, da onde você a instituição que você tá, é, 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 trabalha, ou empresa, onde você é, e a cidade e estado, o país é, da onde você é também, tá? cada um de vocês. É, a gente sempre pede isso, mas é, porque é importante para a gente ter esse, esse... Porque muita gente vem pelo Zoom, né? nem todo mundo faz inscrição, então é muito legal a gente ter essa visão panorâmica de quem é, está quem acompanhando. Né? Então, são todos muito super bem-vindos e eu vou passar a palavra para o Tim. Tim, uh, thank so much for being here. I'm uh, really happy that uh, you are our uh, guest tonight. And um, I, I hope you share a lot of uh, knowledge with uh, all of us. Okay. Uh, you can uh, introduce yourself. Okay. Be comfortable. <laughs> okay. I didn't all understand right? at all what you were saying before, but... Uh, oh, you have but... the translation there. I don't know. It's not working, I think. Um, so I didn't, I didn't understand. It's not it working for English? No. Yeah, it should be. It should um, be. Okay. But, but okay. I'm so sorry. Um, that's all right. I, I'm, um, I, I will, um, you'll have to translate for me along the way if something, if, if someone asks a question or whatever, but, uh, no, but I just, I just did the presentations and, uh, gave some, uh, um, instructions to, for everybody to, to ah, put their yeah, names yeah. and everything, oh, but right. nothing well, very just... serious. Yeah. Watching the chat box uh, going, so I, it looked like you were uh, giving instructions for something. Yeah. So, so, so very good. Hopefully, the translation the other way is working well, so that you uh, are getting the Portuguese version of the English. Um, okay. Let me know if they're not, uh, Cecilia. Um, so yeah. I should I should go ahead and start. It sounds like. Yeah, you can you can uh, talk a little about yourself also okay. about your work. I yeah. think it's very meaningful, okay. and uh, because I don't know if everybody knows you, no, but um, they, they I don't, think it's, I'm sure. it's very good. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And well, I'll start with that. Yeah. Um, and then I will work my way into a, a presentation of sorts about this idea of uh, biophilia and biophilic cities. So, um, so I'm going to minimize the screen, minimize the the viewing. Just I won't see your picture anymore, Cecilia, but if you um, please let me know if something happens and you stop seeing the, the screen or stop hearing me or something. But um, so I'm going to go ahead and just, well, yeah, let me start with a, a little bit of background about myself. So, so yes, I'm uh, an American professor based here in the state of Virginia in a, a city called Charlottesville. Uh, I teach at a university, University of Virginia, where I have been teaching for around 30 years, a little bit, even a little bit longer uh, than that. So a, uh, a long time, uh, actually. And most of my work involves uh, cities uh, to some degree or another, um, and it involves uh, nature and natural environment in, in one form or another. Sometimes it has to do with uh, biodiversity and endangered species. Other times it's had to do with natural hazards and disaster management and coastal planning. Um, I'm very interested in both the practical side of planning uh, and the theoretical and especially lately the ethical dimensions of, of planning practice. So we could maybe get into some very interesting ethical discussions uh, that, about the agenda for tonight. So perhaps that's enough. I'm an urban planner by training. You'll see a little bit of, of uh, discussion of architecture. Um, I'm, I'm not an architect though, but I, I have taught in the School of Architecture for, for so many years that I've come to love uh, architecture in a lot of ways. So I'm going to, for tonight, uh, hope to introduce you to the idea of biophilic cities and the philosophy behind it um, and maybe Hopefully you will feel some comfort to level in using the word biophilia and in and beginning to think about what, what the dimensions are of a biophilic city. So, so to start, for me, I am an urban planner and uh, a lot of my work has been around sustainable cities and sustainable communities and how can we uh, create dense, compact cities, cities that are 
walkable, cities that invest in public transit, cities that have small uh, uh, carbon footprints, ecological footprints. I think most of us argue for uh, denser compact cities, cities that are less sprawling and less uh, land consumptive or uh, e ecologically destructive. Um, but when I start to talk about that, um, I think it's natural for, for uh, viewers to, to wonder, does a compact or dense city mean then that there can't be nature? And so we very much believe that you can have that density and that compactness and also have, have nature. So cities and nature together is a big part of what I'm interested in and, and what our agenda is about. So we started things um, probably 10 or 12 years ago. We created a thing called the Biophilic Cities Project here at the University of Virginia. Uh, it was essentially a research project and we were trying to understand what the leading edge, cutting edge work uh, in cities was around the world. What were the cities that were sort of doing the most and being the most creative and incorporating nature into their design and, and planning? Um, that has transitioned into the creation of uh, a global network of cities called Biophilic Cities, the Biophilic Cities Network uh, that Cecilia has been very uh, active in, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about that uh, later. So at the core, at the, at the heart of this, this idea is the concept of biophilia. Here is in English uh, one uh, definition from E.O. Wilson, Ed Wilson. He, he is the one, he isn't the first person to use the word biophilia, but he's really the one who has coined it in the way that we think of it today. This notion that we, we have this innate uh, affiliation, this innate connection to the natural world, that we're hardwired uh, really to want and need that connection to nature and to all living things. And so we believe that uh, to lead a truly uh, happy and healthy and meaningful life requires that we have that nature all around us. It can't just be nature that we, we enjoy maybe once or twice a year on a holiday. It has to be incorporated into all of the spaces, the spaces around, uh, around where we live and where we work, where we spend most of our day, and most of our time. So that is the big challenge for us. Here is um, another, here's an image of E.O. Wilson, Ed Wilson, uh, faculty member, distinguished professor at Harvard, the human species has grown up in nature. This is actually from a, from a wonderful uh, documentary film called Biophilic Design in which, in which he uh, appears. So I th we could spend um, the whole hour that we have or so uh, talking about the evidence and the, um, the scholarship, the research that demonstrates this power of nature. Uh, for me, however, I think it starts with intuition. It starts with, um, a personal feeling and sense of what things in the world mean the most to me and have the most uh, impact and touch me um, in the most significant way. What are we drawn to it would be another way of expressing that. And for me, it, it's all of the things that you see here. It's uh, trees and flowers and water and living, all kinds of living things, butterflies and birds, especially. I'm gonna talk a fair amount about uh, birds a little bit later in the presentation. So I think we know at an intuitive level that nature is so important uh, to us and does so much for us, but it's good as well to have all of this emerging evidence. And it seems that almost every week there is something new published, uh, a new bit of research that adds to uh, this, this com compelling body of work that shows really the power of nature. This is one uh, example of, of a study published in bioscience uh, showing that for neighborhoods that are greener, neighborhoods that have more birds and, and vegetation, greenery, more trees, uh, that the residents in those neighborhoods uh, are less likely to experience depression, uh, anxiety, and stress. Um, so it's perhaps not a big surprise that nature has this positive power uh, for us. Um, many of you may know about the work, uh, the longstanding work coming out of Japan around the concept of forest bathing. Uh, the Japanese have done all of this wonderful research that shows that um, at the end of a walk uh, in nature, uh, you, where you, you know, experience that, that beautiful, the sights and sounds of a, of a forest, 
that at the end of that walk uh, that your stress hormone levels go down, you get a boost to your immune system. The aerosols uh, being emitted by those pine trees are uh, anti-cancer and um, have answer ca anti-cancer qualities. We are uh, healthier uh, again and happier when we have that nature uh, all around us. Um, one of the things that I'll mention off and on over the course of tonight is that we uh, frequently tell a lot of stories um, by, by making films. And we have a number of short documentary films available on our website. I'll, I'll mention this just in case I forget, but it's biophiliccities.org. Maybe we can uh, put a link to that in the chat box. Uh, and there's a film page and we have a number of short documentary films. I'm, gonna, I'm going to reference a few of them uh, tonight along the way, but this is actually an image from a full length uh, a documentary, a longer one that we did around the nature in marine cities or ocean cities, cities perched on the edge of an ocean, uh, coastal cities. And so this is an image from, from Miami and uh, there's a, a scene in the film where we walk out into the Atlantic Ocean and we follow a group of, of uh, fifth graders. These are elementary school uh, kids and they've come from neighborhoods around Miami uh, many of them underserved neighborhoods. Many of these kids have never been in the water before. And so each uh, group of five or six uh, has a naturalist that walks along with them as they walk into the, into the ocean. And each pair of twos has a net. You see a net here in the picture. And they're encouraged to scoop the bottom of the ocean and see what they can pull up with this net. And it was really a remarkable scene. We were trying to, to keep the camera dry and trying to, you know, filming it was a, as a challenge, but it was quite remarkable to see the experience, to see the, the looks on the kids' faces. In one, at one moment, a child pulls up the, uh, the net and there's something that looks like a, a ball, an inflated ball, an orange ball. And it turns out to be a, a puffer fish. And so as the child puts the net back in the water, the, this object then turns back into what the, what the kids recognize as a fish. And so they're reacting with wonder and awe and, 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 and uh, visibly uh, uh, curious about this, this nature that they had never seen before and, and probably hadn't imagined was just under the surface. So um, a lot of the agenda for tonight and for cities is about cultivating our innate tendencies, as I say here. And um, uh, Stephen Kellert, one of our heroes in the area of biophilic design, used to like to call, used to say that biophilia was a weak, a weak genetic tendency, something that we all have in us, it's innate, but it's kind of like a muscle. It requires us to ex exercise it and to nudge it, to cultivate it. And, uh, and so um, a, a biophilic city is one that provides uh, many, many opportunities to cultivate these innate tendencies. And so actually this is a longer story about the Miami-Dade uh, school district and almost every child that goes through this district, goes through the school system, actually has a chance to experience this, this connection to, to marine life. So we know um, we have all this evidence about the power of nature. There is a science behind these effects and these impacts uh, we don't fully understand uh, what is going on. We have uh, theories about this. Uh, on the right, you see a tree um, meant to show you, to illustrate the fact that we have these fractals, um, fractal shapes and forms in nature. These are self-repeating shapes. You know, the, the leaf of a tree is a small version of a bow, which is a small version of a, of a larger section of a tree, which is a, a small version of the, the larger tree itself self-repeating uh, shapes in nature. And there's the theory uh, that we have evolved a visual system to process that, that those fractal shapes. Um, a guy at the University of Oregon called Richard Taylor, um, he chairs the physics department there, uh, has, has called this fractal fluency. So this idea that we've, we've evolved our visual system uh, to process this, um, these fractals, so so we we process them easily. Um, it's 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 effortless, uh, really, to to look at a tree 
to look at, at clouds going by, to look at water and, and waves and, and, and uh, th those things in nature that we know actually serve to soothe us and calm us. And it's effortless looking as, as uh, Richard Taylor would, would describe. By the way, the image on the left is a really interesting uh, initiative in the UK to use birdsong as a way to um, test hearing, as a, as a sort of less stressful way to test hear to, for hearing loss. And it's meant to remind me actually about birdsong. We have all of this evidence now that uh, when we hear birdsong, it has that effect. It has those effects like that, like that forest bathing, like that walk in a forest. Um, to, to the degree that, that hospitals now are, uh, are recording uh, bird song and then they're playing it back at particularly stressful times uh, during, um, as, as children, for example, will go into surgery or about to get inoculations. So, so nature has all of this wonderful, uh, has, has power um, and, 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 and is hugely important when we think about a life in a city. Um, if I had to try to ar ar array or summarize this evidence, this was my effort to do it several years ago for a healthcare uh, conference. So all the things on the right, and, and unfortunately in English, um, are all things that are connected or shown to be associated with the presence of nature. So we know lower depression, lower anxiety, lower levels of stress. The more nature we have, the, the, the better our mood is, the more happy we are the more likely to, we're gonna get physical activity, but all kinds of other things. So at least in American cities, the more nature, the more trees, the lower the, the crime rate, the lower the levels of gun violence, the lower the levels of social isolation. Um, we have evidence now that even, um, that people are more likely to be generous in the presence of nature, more likely to be cooperative, more likely to, to uh, think longer term. So you can argue, I think, pretty compellingly that we are uh, better human beings, really, when we have nature around us. And this, to me, fits um, entirely the theory of biophilia, that we think about where we are, uh, where, where we're most relaxed and where we're most at home, and it is around nature. So how do you summarize all of these effects or impacts? And I like very much the word flourishing. Flourishing, to me, it captures the the benefits, the delight, the pleasure we get from nature, but also deeper meanings and uh, purpose and purpose of life and connections to place and deep connections to, to each other. So a natureful a city is a flourishing city. Um, I know the pandemic has uh, been hard hitting, hit both of our countries uh, quite, quite hard. Um, I think one of the global lessons of the pandemic is for me, if there's any silver lining, it has to do with recognizing the, the, the power and importance of nature. So these are images from two of our partner cities, Portland, Oregon on the left, Edmonton, Canada on the right. On the left is a park in Portland, one of the largest parks in their city. And um, they receive so much um, demand to be in, the, in their parks that they had to adjust um, the spaces in real time to manage the flow. So in this particular park, they uh, instituted sort of one-way uh, hiking trails so that they could maximize the numbers of people uh, visiting uh, that, that uh, park. But I, I think if there is any, again, saving grace from the pandemic, it is a recognition of how important nature is. But nature is a point of normalcy, a, a, a point of constancy. It is a, a reassuring um, in this crazy daunting time when everything seems out of, out of kilter. Uh, this is an article from the Washington Post. We have a lot of articles about birds and bird watching. And so many people here in the US and around the world have discovered birds and, uh, and are listening for birds. Um, so Wendy Paulson uh, is the author of this commentary in the post, in a bleak year, the natural world is, is our hope. Um, and she talks about, uh, stirs hope, I should say. It invites, inspires, nourishes, instructs, soothes, gladdens, fascinates, uh, delights. And that's very much what birds do. So in fact, we have uh, literally hatched uh, a new generation of bird watchers uh, around the world. So the nature in cities uh, does many 
things for us, of course, many other things. Uh, we want cities, we need cities to be resilient, resilient in the face of climate change and the place of, face, uh, face of sea level rise and coastal flooding and uh, excessive urban heat, major problems that cities are facing. Um, just about anything that you can do to make a city more biophilic and more natureful will also make it more resilient. These are images from Rotterdam in the Netherlands. Um, their, their concerns have, to have a lot to do with water and water management. So they're investing in uh, green rooftops and in, and in plaza, water plazas and water squares. That's the image a second from the left uh, that are designed to be places of outdoor nature and outdoor gathering. Um, but also when it rains, um, they are designed to capture and, and retain uh, stormwater. So the idea of kind of multifunctional uh, uh, infrastructure in, in, uh, in cities. Uh, here I am a few months ago next to a pretty old tree, actually in the Netherlands. Um, for me, nature in cities uh, serves other functions too that we maybe don't talk enough about there is this sort of deep uh, connection. Nature, particularly trees like this, are, are what is the connective tissue, tissue between the past, the present, and the future, right? And this is a wonderful quote from James Canton, who's uh, written this book, this new book, The Oak Papers. By touching the skin of the oak, it is possible to feel some tentative trace of those that have gone before. So that ancient tree uh, is something, it's a time marker. It's a, it's a part of our community. It's a part of our, our world and our city, our cities. And we want them, they sequester so much carbon. They do many things for us. It's impossible really to replace them with seedlings or, or young trees. So we need to protect the nature that we have that, that already exists in cities. And especially for things like ancient trees, they, they provide that sort of temporal uh, interconnectedness, if you will. So um, I want to just talk about a little more detail. W what are the practices? What are the policies? What are the things that kind of define a biophilic city? Um, I may, Cecilia may already have talked about the idea of biophilic design. We certainly have seen the emergence of a lot of architecture and, and building scale projects that incorporate nature. Um, that's you know, really important. And we like to say that a biophilic city is certainly a city where everything incorporates biophilic design. It's a city of, of many biophilic buildings. Um, the, here are just a few examples. Ty Farrow is an architect based in, in Toronto. We've gotten to know him. You see the living nature, but also the shapes and forms of nature, this uh, wonderful feeling of entering this cancer center, uh, enter, entering what, what feels like a, a forest, this, this sort of engineered, laminated, engineered wood, wood really creative work. Uh, Stephen Kellert, I um, have to give a lot of credit to him. He came up with this sort of framework of uh, biophilic design elements and attitudes, attributes rather, we can talk in more detail about this later if you're interested and we're kind of adapting this this table from Amanda Sturgeon's book on biophilic design. No time to talk about all of these uh, elements and all of these features, uh, but uh, I want to just highlight a few things. You know, it's maybe obvious, but it's uh, buildings and design uh, that incorporates living nature, plants and animals, and but also botanical motifs and and uh, animal motifs and, and the fractals uh, again, but it's natural light and, and lights and shadows and, and, and um, at, a, at larger levels and scales, it's more about connecting to, to place, um, prospect and refuge. Uh, these are really important ideas in the biophilic design world and happy to circle back and, and talk about them in more, in more detail later. So we have a, a lot of case studies and a lot of our work has been documenting those wonderful biophilic, uh, biophilic design buildings. This is one that we have a short film about on our film page, uh, the Center for Sustainable Landscapes at the Phipps Conservatory in Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh is one of our uh, members of our biophilic cities, uh, uh, biophilic cities network. This is a wonderful building. You see the green roof, but it's, um, 
greenery and nature in the interior of the building. It's operable windows, the, you know, natural ve ventilation, beautiful views of nature around the building, a lot of native uh, landscaping. So uh, it's a wonderful story and a wonderful example. Another example, another film, five or seven minute we film we have on our, our page, uh, Interface Carpets uh, Headquarters uh, building in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, this is a retrofit building. One of the most dramatic features of it is this, are these glass panels that wrap the exterior uh, and, and this polyester sheath in the form of a life-sized uh, forest. It's really visually dramatic and, um, and wonderful dappled light and it's bird friendly and a, a lot of other green features, but uh, it's a really wonderful building. Or buildings like the new Designers Walk in Toronto. Um, and I'm, I'm sure you've probably uh, talked about the Bosco Verticale in Milan. Um, there are a number of other architects and, and, and cities where uh, vertical forests are, are, are popping up. You've gotten to know the designer here. Several hundred trees built uh, into the floor plates or designed into the floor plates, the living space for those, uh, for those trees. Quite a remarkable story and really remarkable because the neighbors in this neighborhood around the building came to, to defend and support the project and uh, really wanted to see it. They saw it as an improvement in the neighborhood. So we say that a biophilic city is a city with lots of biophilic buildings, um, but it's much more than that, right? It's These are cities that, again, work hard to connect us to the nature around us. It's about buildings, but it's also about parks and gardens and and urban trees and, and urban wildlife and trails and, and pathways and, and you know, larger e ecological and hydrological features like rivers. It's about connecting us to each other, about connecting us to nature. It's about uh, recognizing a city as uh, a space we, we co-occupy uh, with other many other forms of life, uh, ideally, and that we have an ethical duty to, to care for that nature and to make room for those other forms of life. And we frequently talk about this idea of, of coexistence as being a, a big part of this. So our cities and our network are increasingly moving in the direction of this vision of a immersive kind of nature, right? So uh, from, from a, a vision of a city where you have a few parks, maybe in a few places that you visit nature to a vision of a city that uh, is itself a larger ecosystem, which it is, and so you, instead of having to go to the park or go to the forest or go to the garden, we're, we're living in the garden, we're living in the forest, we're living uh, in nature. This is an image actually from Singapore, one of our uh, original partner cities. They have for many years called themselves a garden city. Um, then they shifted their motto to city in a garden, which uh, seems like a small change, but really quite profound. And more recently, uh, they've been calling themselves a city in nature, uh, feeling like perhaps the word garden implies uh, a little less wild nature and a little bit, um, perhaps a little bit too, too, too much uh, nature that's, that's human tended and, and human managed. So, so for them, um, they are put, they've put into place a, a whole series of planning policies and, and standards um, when you build a building like this one, Park Royal Hotel, uh, you are required now to at least replace the nature lost by the footprint, the ground level nature lost um, from the footprint of the building. Um, you have to replace that in the form of vertical nature. So sky parks and green, uh, green roofs and, and, and green walls. And, and so this particular uh, structure um, replaces it at more than 200 or tw twice what is lost at ground level. It's a really interesting building as well. And, and so Singapore is helping us to imagine how those uh, green rooftops can connect with multiple layers of tree canopy that connect to ground level parks. And again, seeing the city as this sort of really this thing of immersive nature in a highly interconnected uh, a city. So if I had to summarize uh, some of the, the, the main qualities of a biophilic city, um, they would be these things. Uh, immersive nature, integrated, continuous and seamless, integration of built and natural environments, 
yes, we want parks, but we have to think beyond parks. Uh, biodiversity and wildness. Um, we have to think about social justice and the distribution of nature, so just and inclusive. Um, it's a whole of city and a whole of life approach. Whole of city meaning from roof or room, building scale all the way to region or bioregion and all the scales in between. Whole of life, um, you, you experience that nature in the very early ages of your life, all the way through adulthood and, and into elderhood. And then finally, this culture of biophilia. It's not simply the presence of nature. How do we engage that nature? Do we care about that nature? Is it what do we do to appreciate that nature? Um, and and can, can we imagine a whole society, a culture that, that forms around the celebration, the appreciation, the enjoyment of that nature? Here is an image of Helsinki, the idea again of connected, multi-scaled nature, a whole of, of city uh, approach. Again, a whole of life approach. Uh, we have a short film about uh, this school, which is near Atlanta, uh, Georgia. It's the Chattano Chattahoochee Hills Charter School. It's on our webpage as well. Um, it's a, a school that's designed as a series of buildings where the kids come with their boots and their jackets, and they expect to spend a good part of the day outside and taking their, <clears throat> their English assignments and math assignments into the forest. So we want full, uh, full life immersion as well at, at, as full nature immersion, if that makes sense. So immersion over the course of your lifespan, of your life uh, from, again, from young to, to old. We frequently talk about uh, this nature as a kind of matrix. Um, it's interconnected, again, shifting from a view of a city with just a few points of nature to really uh, uh, an ecosystem. It's also a continuum along indoor and outdoor. Uh, we do believe that since we do spend so much time indoors, we, we've got to bring nature inside. Um, but a good part of the challenge is to get people outside, to propel us outside. And then we've got to think about how we overcome the barriers between indoors and out, out of doors. We again like to think that uh, the nature that we want and need is nature that's going to be around us uh, where we live and work. It's going to be what I would call everyday nature. Others, Stephen Keller and others have, have used that terminology as well. So we talk about this idea of a nature pyramid, kind of like the food pyramid that we've used here in the US to describe a healthy food diet. Those things at the top of the pyramid are, are kinds of foods, uh, things like salt and uh, meat and things that are maybe good for us in small quantities but we've got to build our healthy diet by those things at the base of the pyramid. So uh, fruits and vegetables, for example. Well, similarly, you can think about nature in a city. It can't be that far away nature. We can't really sustain the, the, e the ecological footprint, the carbon footprint associated with immersing yourself in far away nature. It has to be all those things that you are going to see and experience at the neighborhood level. Uh, hourly uh, and daily and, and weekly. Um, those are the things that we want to, to uh, describe. We want to have those things uh, all around us. Uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania is in our network um, and they have uh, thought about a lot of different kinds of things as being part of what makes them a biophilic city. It is the convergence of rivers. It's, it's water and, and this aquatic ecosystem. It's, it's parks that connect people to that water. It's a pretty impressive tree canopy cover of 42%. It's uh, ecological design, uh, like green rooftops again. It's, it's a wonderful new park, 600 acre park downtown. Um, so our cities in the network are doing really remarkable things. And I'm just gonna give you a little bit of a flavor in the time that I have left about what some of, the, some of those things are. So you, you get a little bit of a sense of this, uh, it's everything from you know city scale, green belt net systems and blue belt systems, uh, to you know parks along the edges of shorelines and rivers. It's tree planting, it's wildlife passages, all kinds of of different things that cities are doing. So there's no one model. There are it's up to each city to to explore how the philosophy and the idea of biophilia and biophilic design and planning um, uh, expresses itself 
in their city. Um, there are a great many different ways to put these ideas into practice. I won't go through the slide, but a lot of different urban design elements from, again, green rooftops and green walls to kind of neighborhood scale, tree planting and, and gardens and food, food production, making spaces for uh, wildlife, again, it is nature, again, at multi, multiple scales, even little nature, green alleyways, front yards and backyards, the spaces around buildings are really important, all the way out to larger regional um, green space networks and, and larger strategies for biodiversity conservation. It's ecological connectivity, but it's also human connectivity. So I've been very interested in how we create environments for uh, walking through cities and spending time in public spaces in cities, but that spaces that are extremely uh, biophilic and natureful. So Singapore, here is an um, example of the Park Connectors Network, 350 kilometers in that, in that city. San Francisco, one of our partner cities, has a program for converting uh, the median strips of roads into small, small parks. You may have heard about their work around parklets. This is a wonderful program, more than 100 of these uh, street parks uh, have been created. Uh, Jane Martin has been an activist in San Francisco. She's helped create this new sidewalk landscape permit in San Francisco, which allows residents to uh, take out a jackhammer uh, and, and take up pavement, a uh, hard surface from in their neighborhoods and plant uh, gardens. Uh, so there are so many different ways that we can find to fit nature, to grow more nature in cities. This is an image from the city of Antwerp uh, in Belgium. Uh, where they talk a lot about garden streets, converting, um, again, hard, hard surface streets, streets that maybe were mostly for cars into, into garden, beautiful garden pedestrian spaces. Um, I do believe that uh, there are some wonderful uh, codes and ordinances and new standards that many of our biophilic cities are embracing. This is an image from, again, from San Francisco where they have, they become the first American city to mandate uh, green rooftops um, through their better roofs ordinance. And actually you see an example here, uh, you either have to install a green roof or a solar roof or some combination of uh, a screen and solar. And increasingly that's happening, which you see here on the left, the example on the left. And that's what we're calling here anyway, biosolar. And there are actually some really interesting advantages um, both to biodiversity and the nature and also to the with the biodiversity and the green roof, the uh, photovoltaic panels are producing power more efficiently, actually. So it's a very interesting combination. We want wildness in our cities. Um, this is actually another example of a, of a film on our webpage. Uh, the conversion in the city of Perth in Western Australia, conversion of a very sterile, energy intensive uh, water feature into what is a native biodiverse wetland uh, in the middle of the city in a wonderful space for birds and for humans. Um, we can think about all those spaces around our homes as opportunities for planting native species of, of, of uh, you know, uh, bushes and, and uh, grasses and, and trees. This is our colleague Nina Marie Lister on the right, uh, and in Toronto, she uh, has ignited a discussion about this there. She was um, actually told that her native garden was illegal in Toronto under their tall grass uh, and weeds ordinance. Um, anyway, it uh, led to a, a fight, a battle, uh, if you will, and they have been able, Nina Marie and her group have been able to get them to um, change the code, change the bylaw, so that it is an, a, by, a by right uh, that you can plant a native garden around your, your house. Um, cities like Fremantle, Frio, one of our partner cities, has a system for uh, subsidizing and encouraging the planting of these verges between sidewalks and, and roads, um, planting them with native species grown actually in municipal uh, greenhouses. Um, Curie de Vat, a city in Costa Rica, has one of, been one of our partner cities as well. Wonderful story of actually rethinking this landscaping along sidewalks and in parks and throughout the city um, so that they are uh, pollinator spaces and bio corridors. 
and uh, so their their program is called Ciudad Dulce, um, Sweet City. And uh, so here's a sweet sidewalk on on the right. Really interesting initiative. And I love, by the way, here's a Guardian story uh, about the uh, about their effort. They've been winning all kinds of awards, and the mayor actually used to talk about giving birds and and bees. And, and plants citizenship in the city. And I really love that uh, idea. Victoria Gastez, the capital of the Basque country and Spain, uh, their wonderful story of their green ring that circles the city and bringing the green ring into the center. Here is a project where they have daylight, daylight brought back to the surface a, uh, a small river that was under a pipe, in a pipe under, underground. Lots of examples of our cities that have been making space for other forms of life back to Singapore. Wonderful story of their smooth coated otters and now more than 80 of these otters. Uh, partly it's a result of investing in uh, habitat restoration like the Bichon Park on the left. Um, and, uh, and in the image there, it's full of rainwater. One of the things it's designed to do um, is to retain uh, flood water, um, which it's doing uh, very, very well. We have a short film also about the uh, about the otters. Austin, Texas, another of our partner cities, wonderful story of uh, their million and a half Mexican free-tailed bats that uh, have taken up a home, uh, come every summer and take up a home underneath uh, the main bridge in downtown Austin, and a wonderful story of how that city has uh, grown to love the bats. Edmonton, Canada uh, has a planning system that builds on ecological connectivity um, and a wonderful story there. Everything is evaluated according to how a, an animal might move uh, through that city. Um, and so they have been building uh, a number of wildlife passages. Here's the latest, one of the latest ones anyway, on the left. Um, there are now more than 35 of them. So this idea of ecological connectivity, designing the spaces of the city, uh, for nature and, and also for birds. So uh, in Edmonton, they've been using circuit theory um, as a way to understand how birds, how, uh, what the city would be like as a chickadee um, moving through that, that period. Are there places where you can't cross, where the, where the forest canopy isn't connected? Um, that's a kind of really important way to understand the city. So my own work lately has been around birds. I've had a special love of birds uh, and a new, a, a new book called The Bird Friendly City. We've been getting some good press. Here's a story uh, on Fast Company on the left. So we can and must design buildings and cities to be bird friendly. That means rethinking glass. This is the Jacob Javits Center in, in New York City that retrofit all of their glass with fritted glass uh, glass that has a pattern on the glass that birds can see. Birds don't recognize glass as a barrier, so they fly into it and 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 die, or or are severely injured. And and in the U.S. alone, there are something like a billion birds killed each year because of glass. By the way, there's a green roof on the top of this retrofit as well. We can be designing spaces for birds into every building and every uh, neighborhood and cities. This is a um, a historic building uh, rebuilt in London where the chimney, the new chimney has uh, spaces for nesting um, swifts, the common European swift, which is, which is in decline. Um, we have to think about lighting, of course, has to be a, a big part of the story as well. Pittsburgh, our partner city, uh, has just adopted a dark sky lighting ordinance. So it's going to be requiring full cutoff dark sky lighting in all of its uh, parks. And other cities that of course are turning lights out during key migration uh, times. Um, Philadelphia, one of the one of more than 30 cities now doing that. So um, my, my notion of a bioflex city is also one that, uh, that fosters a sense of awe and, and wonder. And, and um, wonder is one of those things that, that we benefit from in many different ways. There's a lot of evidence uh, when we experience awe, we're more likely to be generous again. Um, and awe is, here's Rich Louv's definition of awe. Uh, we encounter something unexpected that stimulates a sense of vastness and possibility. 
there's a, sort of a constellation of terms. So how can we um, facilitate experiences of awe in a, in a city? We have a short film about the return of whales to the waters of New York City. That's, a, that's an awe-inspiring experience. I want to live in a city where I might catch a glimpse uh, of a humpback whale uh, or, or a dolphin, um, perhaps even a, a, out of the, you know, on, a, off the balcony I'm sitting on or my window. Um, so we need to be thinking about designing for awe. I mentioned outdoor uh, cities and biophilic cities are, are indeed outdoor cities. How do we propel us outdoor, outdoors? Um, Edmonton is a great example of this. During the winter, they've developed a winter strategy to encourage more time spent in nature and, and out in, in the outdoor world. Um, they do it in many creative ways, uh, including a set of winter design guidelines to create uh, wind blocks and and uh, warming stations and places that will make it uh, more enjoyable, easier, uh, more more fun to be outside in nature. And by the way, the lower right is a lots of cities have freeways. Uh, Edmonton has this idea of freezeways that uh, you could skate from your home to your office uh, on one of these uh, you know skating paths on ice uh, ice ribbons, if you will. In Charlottesville, my hometown, um, it's often about addressing heat and uh, particularly in the summer months, uh, heat and humidity. Uh, we want people outside. We want you to, to enjoy nature. How do you do that? Well, trees are a big part of the answer, right? A big part of what we need to do to address urban heat. So this is our downtown mall where we've planted uh, six, more than 60 mature willow oak trees. They provide evapotranspiration and, uh, and shading. Um, and, uh, and by the way, um, maybe a little bit later I have, we, we've been looking at, at tree codes uh, and some wonderful uh, places like Asheville, North Carolina and Palo Alto, California that have uh, wonderful initiatives, ordinances basically to protect uh, trees. So I'm um, seeing that I have maybe five minutes left. I'm not sure, Cecilia, if I started right at 5.30, but, uh, chime in, let me know. Um, can you give me a five minute warning or a couple of minutes warning about when I should stop? Sure, Hope sure. Stop. Okay. No um, I don't think I'm going to get through all of the slides, but um, you know, it, it's really important to spend a few minutes talking a little bit more about the idea of social equity, social justice, uh, so many of our cities are, uh, particularly the American cities, I think, are uh, continuing to deal with the, the longstanding effects of systemic racism and, uh, and segregation, going back to redlining practices. And, and, and that can be seen pretty clearly in the distribution of nature. So for example, neighborhoods of color uh, are going to be neighborhoods where tree canopy is, is much lower and where access to parks is much uh, lower. So we call this just, just biophilia. And uh, these are examples or images from our partner city, Richmond, Virginia. They have a new uh, comprehensive plan for their city that's uh, laid out uh, nature targets, minimum targets for every neighborhood, uh, focusing especially on those uh, underserved neighborhoods um, and those that have experienced high heat vulnerability. And what that means is um, actually work to create new parks in places where uh, there haven't been enough parks. This is the new, uh, not new any longer, but the mayor of Richmond, LeVar Stoney, and he's now uh, created five new parks already uh, in the city to address this. And, uh, and stories like uh, Cully Park in Portland, Oregon, a, a park, a new park created in a city, in a neighborhood that didn't have a park and actually designing and managing that park um, by engaging the population, the residents there, actually designing the spaces of the, of the park. We have a, a short five minute film about uh, a Cully Park on the webpage as well. So there are a lot of dimensions of biophilic city planning, a lot of different metrics that we could talk about. And uh, I just, I won't go through all of this and we'll make the slides available and you may wanna spend some time later with them a uh, main point here is that it's not simply the, the presence of, or absence of nature. Again, it's the, all those ways that we relate to nature, we care about nature, we engage nature, 
and, and, and the ways in which a city government uh, cares about that nature. What portion of their budget is devoted to, to restoring and, and caring for the nature uh, there? Um, these are all really important uh, metrics. Uh, we do have wonderful stories. Reston, Virginia is another of our partner cities. They've just had this, um, this biophilic uh, pledge, uh, things that you can do, um, you know, agree to do a certain number of things. Um, this is a city that has organized so many wonderful ways to engage the public. Uh, bio blitzes and you know butterfly and, and dragonfly counts and all kinds of different ways. A, a wonderful nature center, and about fifty percent of the residents actually are engaged in nature in some way over the course of the year. A Saint Le Saint Louis, Missouri, wonderful story of their initiative called Milkweeds for Monarchs. Um, you know, challenging residents to plant butterfly gardens. Now more than 400 of them. You can go online and find them uh, on a web page. Really successful. Um, so I want to just challenge everybody thinking about their city to, to think um, about nature, think about bold goals and targets, and, and what are the metrics for success. And it may not be gross domestic product or regional domestic product or or you know, an economic me measure necessarily, maybe we ought to be more creative and be thinking about a measure of eco ecosystem health um, or you know, one of my favorite metrics that I'm always talking about is birdsong. Let's judge the value of a city by, whether, by the extent to which residents can hear wherever they are, wh wh whichever neighborhood they live in, um, native birdsong. That to me is, is a really good uh, a, a metric. Our friend uh, Cecil uh, uh who's a forester, has put forward this really provocative uh, rule on target 330, 300. So you ought to be able to see three trees out your window where you live or work. Um, there ought to be a minimum 30% tree canopy cover and you ought to be within 300 meters of a park or green space. That's a pretty good uh, standard. We have a, an article where he talks about this in our Biophilic Cities Journal. So just the last uh, handful of slides have a little bit more to do with the network. So we have um, some criteria for joining the network as a, as a partner city. We have uh, 25 partner cities, but we also have uh, several thousand individual members of the network and hundreds of organizations as members of the network. There's Mayor Peduto, the mayor of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, receiving the certificate as they've joined the network. Uh, there's usually a celebratory event of some kind. Uh, we did a big one at the Phipps Conservatory uh, uh, there. We often get really good uh, publications, press coverage. So when Birmingham and the, and the UK joined the network, we got a really nice uh, story in The Guardian, uh, another Guardian story. So um, here is the latest map. It is uh, heavily oriented towards North America and Europe. Um, we hope to expand more into Latin America. Uh, we hope to have more uh, cities in uh, India and Australia, um, and as well as China and uh, Africa. So we, we hope, uh, we're hoping to expand this network and to tr make it truly uh, global, and we think that the, the vision of biophilic cities um, is just perfect for the times we're in, and it clearly does seem to be gaining traction. So we do many things in the network. A lot of it is about sharing insights and ins inspiration and information. We have an online journal called Biophilic Cities. Uh, so at that web page I mentioned, biophiliccities.org, you can find all of the issues uh, online there. There's Bosco Verticale on, on the cover of one of our, issue, one of our uh, uh, issues. Um, we compare, contrast codes. We collect good practice, best practice. These are, again, examples of the Better Roofs Code in San Francisco. Uh, and on the left, uh, San Francisco, the first American city to have adopted minimum bird, bird safe design standards uh, in, that, in that city. Uh, we collaborate with other organizations. Um, this is an image from a um, a, a, a jointly organized lecture series with the Smithsonian Institution in, in Washington. Again, uh, all of these films, um, we have longer 
uh, full length films about Singapore. Uh, and I mentioned the Ocean Cities film uh, uh, earlier. Um, here's Grant Pearsall, um, the former parks director for um, the city of Edmonton being, being filmed. This is a wonderful little film about Edmonton. Uh, we've had film festivals. This is one that happened right before the, the pandemic happened in, 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 uh, in Richmond. And it was also an opportunity to, to give them their certificate as they joined the network. Uh, we do things with our cities. We collaborate around events. Uh, Pittsburgh, we helped Pitt, Pittsburgh organize a neighborhood biophilic design uh, uh, workshop, which was wonderful, uh, again, right before the pandemic. Uh, we've had examples of cities, Edmonton, for example, and, and Vittoria Gastez have developed uh, agreements to work together uh, around certain issues, bio, biodiversity conservation in their case. Uh, cities are, member cities are hosting uh, visits from other cities. This is an image from uh, a, a visit, uh, a group from Singapore came to visit San Francisco to learn about its bird safe design uh, requirements. Um, so a lot of that happens. Uh, we helped organize events. Uh, we've just, last week, um, we had to move this online, but we've done this annual Biophilic Leadership Summit uh, just outside Atlanta, when it's in person anyway, uh, collaboration with something called the Biophilic uh, Institute uh, based there, wonderful biophilic community called Serenby. So a lot of things on the webpage I'd love for you to look at. Uh, we have started a, what we're calling a Biophilic Cities uh, pattern library or pattern book, uh, a kind of crowdsourced um, cataloging of uh, creative uh, expressions of nature, patterns of nature um, in cities, in our, in our partner cities and beyond. Uh, these are some, just some examples based on the idea of the pattern language from uh, Chris Alexander, Christopher Alexander's uh, work. I'm, I'm almost to the end, I think, at this point. We do uh, also do research and, and publish. Uh, so we publish books. Here's another full length uh, film called The Nature of Cities that uh, was playing on uh, PBS stations here in the US for a while. Uh, this is one of the most recent books, uh, the Handbook of Biophilic City Planning and Design that, by the way, has case studies of a lot of our kind of major partner cities. So um, Victoria Gestez and, and San Francisco, Portland, uh, Singapore. And that's been recently translated into Chinese. So um, so I, that's it really at this point. Point I, I um, know I went a little bit fast at times, um, but I would love for you to go and visit the, the webpage again. Here it is, biophiliccities.org. There are films. Uh, there's a page for uh, each of the 25 partner cities. So a lot more information, uh, doc documents and, and uh, web links, and, and uh, in, in some cases, short videos. Um, but a, a lot of information. And, and once cities join the network, there is a sort of um, other platform, a collaborative platform that's not, not public facing. This is uh, the public facing web, web, web page, biophilicsys.org. But increasingly, we're trying to develop um, more sophisticated tools to allow us to, uh, to collaborate. And I'm happy to talk in a little bit more detail uh, about what, you know, what the network does and how the cities uh, work together. But um, that's it for now. So I will stop sharing. Um, and, and hopefully there's some time for questions at this point. Uh, I, I'd be happy to, to take some. Thanks a lot, Jim. Uh, wonderful presentation, a lot, a lot, a lot of content of initiative and cities and examples and about plants, about animals, about water. And it's like, wow, it's like I'm, <laughs> I'm quite still processing uh, all you present us. It's wonderful. And, and uh, we have a lot of questions. And oh, okay. I believe we won't get through all of the questions because there are many. Uh, okay. I think Cecilia just have a problem with his internet connection because ah, no, I'm just not. sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry, but my connection um, is not good. We had the technician today, and it's been, it's not really good. I I fell a few times. <laughs> I I, uh, I like your backdrop though. You've got you've got lots of 
lots of books and uh, I have a few books behind me. As you do. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's important to be fortified. Yeah. With, I have uh, many of you here, not, not <laughs> all of them, but uh, oh, well, I think yeah. eight or more. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, could be. Thanks so much, um, uh, sure. Tim. It was Happy so inspiring. Tim. It was really great to see all this uh, cities uh, engaged uh, with this. I, I participated in the, in the 2013 launch and uh, yeah. yeah, it was so, so, so good to see how, how this uh, network has been growing along the years and um, all the meetings that you promote. Um, and uh, every time I can, um, <laughs> but uh, right. and sometimes the time uh, is not very good. I'm, and no, uh, no. but I learn a lot every every meeting we have. Yeah, it's, no. it's really it's, amazing. You really do. It's remarkable what you learn about. What yeah, you it's it's, it's un you unbelievable. And um, uh, I think. Uh, um, well, this was really inspiring. I, I have so many notes here, yes. but I think we have some questions and we don't yeah. have yes. a lot of time. Yeah. So I think we should go. Unfortunately, uh, I can't read, read any of it, but are, is, um, is there, a, are there some consistent themes or what, what, uh, yes. what do you think the most? Just, just one thing before we, we, we start with the questions, I, I find very nice is the question about metrics. Uh, yeah. Because we talk a lot of sustainability, of uh, regeneration, but I like to the scientific approach about numbers, you know, before and after we make some change for, for the regeneration. And, and I really fell in love with the idea of monitoring the bird songs, you know, it's like, it's, <laughs> good. I, I'm so used like about like, you know, like a uh, concentration of pollution in the air, in the soil, in the water, but I never think about to like monitoring the, the, birds, the song of the birds. And it's such a nice idea. It opened my mind to a lot of way of making new monitoring, new metrics for the city, you know, more, more close to our sense and a little bit more uh, far from pure science, you know, and pure chemical. You know, it's really nice metrics. And, Really, really, really. Uh, a lot of people like saying like just let me talk as you call uh, brought birds uh to the conversation uh we have a very an expert and on birds here oh. in he casual he's here i don't know where he is wow but he is with us <laughs> great and he he does uh Bird watch walks in the Botanic Garden Rio de Janeiro for more than 20 years, right? And Hiki, I don't know where you are. Wonderful. Open your camera. That's an order. Where are you? <laughs> you have to. Yeah. You have to. Oh, there he is. Okay. His, yeah, it's great to have you here, Hiki. It's really, really great. And he's an expert on birds and he's a very good friend also my neighbor here in the, the countryside and uh, in Rio also. He teaches on uh, at uh, Puki also in the same university. And he's been an uh, enthusiast of uh, biophilia, bi biophilic cities too. So he was grabbed by this and he's a biologist. So uh, that's really great. Yeah. And I think uh, his walks are very, very inspiring for everybody in real right. it should be in the in the portfolio that we was applying <laughs> because it's uh, he is responsible for uh, i think hundreds of people uh being uh grabbed by by the the songbirds but uh, yeah that's great singing birds, <laughs> birds. Yeah. we have a question like about uh, our condition in brazil we have cities that are really unequal we have like strong social problem and uh, some people are, say, are asking for how in this kind of circumstance, you know, in, in high, highly nickel cities, can we start uh, talking um, uh, about biophilic cities and trying to transform uh, our city in biophilic cities? Yeah. Yeah, I, I would I would lo love to have a conversation of, of, about that. Y your your audiences will be much more informed than I am. I I have been um, uh, a couple of times to Brazil, and uh, one once a, a wonderful month long uh, uh, tour around the country. Really, really 
uh, striking. And I, I know there is the favela issue um, where you have uh, extreme, you know, um, separation and, and a lot of people living in informal housing. Um, and we're, we're confronting, of course, a, a, a very severe homelessness problem in many American cities. So it's a kind of parallel thing. Um, but uh, I, I don't know. I've been trying to collect um, good examples. Cecilia will have will know much more about this than, than I do. But uh, uh, examples from around the world where um, biophilia um, has been incorporated into the design and functioning of, of informal settlements into into favelas. You know, I think it's if ever there is uh, a need or or an important role for for nature, it is it is there, right? It's it's um, uh, less important for for more affluent people, really, right? I mean, it's those places where uh, nature is really needed and and where it could be uh, be doing a lot of good service. It could be about growing food, and it could be about um, you know, filtering water and doing you know, uh, doing all kinds of, of, of e important e ecological and other uh, services for us in places where we, we need it. So um, it's certainly, I mentioned a little bit about uh, the, the um, just biophilia in the, in the American setting, at least. Um, it is it, the social equity issues have really risen to the to the front. Partly because of the terrible, you know, story George Floyd killing and a lot of things that have happened here, um, so there's an awareness about uh, uh, inequality that is at the at the heart of the discussion about nature, right? So it's no longer acceptable uh, for a segregated neighborhood, um, you know, a, a black or brown neighborhood in an American city to to have a you know five percent tree canopy. Uh, when that affluent white neighborhood has 50%, you know, it, it translates into real differences in health. And so um, I don't know how many of those, those strategies or tools would apply to Brazilian cities or, you know, other cities more generally around the world. Um, but I think it's a wonderful question. I don't have a, I don't have a, you know, a, 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 a great answer. Um, as I said, I, our vision of biophilic cities is really, it's not a rigid, template that has to fit this, you know, it, it has to be the same thing in every place. It can't be that way. The circumstances, the um, environment, the ecology, the politics, everything will be different from place to place. So um, I, I would think that the, the biophilic agenda uh, as applied to, to favelas would be, would be a really productive uh, conversation, really productive policy realm. Are there are there good examples? Are there is this happening, Cecilia? <laughs> Maybe kind of throw the question back to you. Oh, um, I, I think I, I think the, I, I always talk about the green roof favela uh, mm. in uh, favela do Arara in Rio, because okay. there, there is a green roof that was uh, uh, in, implemented there with the. Uh, a thesis. This is something that you should know. It's very interesting, and he is uh, 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 he's not the only one, but uh, he's uh, transforming this also in a social business. Okay. So I think it's going. I to don't know anything about it. I'd love to. I'd love yeah, to learn. Yeah, but it. everything is in Portuguese. I can send you his Facebook. Oh, he's very okay. active on that. Great. But it's in Portuguese, so that's okay. I wonder if he would. Um, we could interview him or or. Maybe yeah, even. I think so. I can, uh, yeah, make the connection. Okay. And uh, I think many other in initiatives like Verdejar is uh, one that is happening uh, already since the 90s, 1990s, in uh, Morro de Misericórdia, the Misericórdia Hill, right in the heart of uh, Complexo do Alemão, which is one of the uh, largest and uh, more uh, violent favelas. I mean, where, where the criminals are very mm. the militia and the drug dealers are in the area. So, and um, this, I have uh, written about this in a, in a book, okay. uh, one edited by Thomas Elmquist. Oh. I have written, okay. yeah, there is a chapter, I can send this to you. Oh, I'd love to, so that's an yeah. English problem. Yeah. yeah. And, okay, good. Uh, 
Yeah. Uh, uh, what there is are the other initiatives because uh, yeah. it's not uh, always always uh, bottom up. Uh, bottom up is better yeah. if you can do. Yeah, that because yeah. Uh, now it's going to uh, happen. Uh, it's going to start the uh, Park Hialengo in Rio, the Hialengo Park, it, which is is not in a favela, but it's in a neighborhood in the north zone, which is re really paved. The, the entire uh, north of Rio de Janeiro is very paved. Okay. And uh, now they are uh, opening a, a call for a park and uh, a angle. Okay. And um, uh, I, I don't want to talk too much. I don't want to hear you. Uh, and we have some uh, the questions. I just okay. heard the one in English. I, I oh. read here that Fabiano uh, put a, a question that uh, is okay. quite interesting also. Okay, uh, in the chat box, or does that person want to? to yeah, to, to it's in it? the chat. If you if you want to, if you can reach it, otherwise I can. Uh, he, he is asking uh, why uh, you didn't talk about because it's very popular to say green infrastructure and now uh, more recently nature based solutions. Yeah. It didn't you didn't touch uh, the two oh. terms, and he wants to know about the, yeah. the, the conceptual or uh, yeah. What, yeah. It, it, uh, yeah. How do you it's, relate uh, biophilia with this? Uh... Yeah. Yeah, it's a great question um, because it is <clears throat> it is uh, intentional, um, and uh, I I don't want to offend anybody. Uh, if you have some fa favorite language, um, I you know the idea of nature based this, nature based that, nature based climate adaptation, you name it, nature based. Uh, has been language especially used in Europe uh, and it's and it's relatively new you know it's like in the last five years um, everything is nature based uh, I don't like that language particularly um, I, I I recognize the need to, to use it sometimes and I do use it sometimes myself um, I don't think of um, for example um, birds are not the answer to something I mean, it, it, nature nature has inherent worth, has intrinsic value. So much of what the biophilia is about is is not a is not necessarily a utilitarian or an instrumental view of nature. So that's that's my it's more encompassing, um, and the nature based this or that to me uh, is language that implies we're going to use nature to do something uh, to to achieve something. To, to if we could use something else, if that um, engineered stormwater pond was more effective than a constructed wetland, then we would use it. You know, it's like we're trying to solve a problem, and and nature is just a tool on the way to, to solving that problem. So I have a little bit of a problem with that language. Uh, e equally so with green infrastructure, although I'm more likely to to use that just because you know maybe because we've been. That's language we've had for you know 30 years or longer, um, and 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 there is a case to be made that that uh, we, we you know it's helpful in, in terms of balancing the power um, of you know putting that putting nature on a on a on a level that's on a level playing field with other kinds of infrastructure. I, th I think there's some some utility there or some some value there, but. But yeah, I have a I have a little bit of a problem with the nature-based solutions uh, language. Um, I think we're all you know we're kind of you know we when we're in the same room and we're we're often talking about very similar things and we often do seem to have very similar values. But but uh, I, I don't like that as much. So it's a good question. Um, it's interesting that you picked up on that. Um, yeah. What do yeah, you think? Yeah. Do you agree with that, or do you do you do you think that's wrong? Or that I talk not... a lot about nature-based solutions. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's fine. Every everybody seems to. That's that's really that's. But really I great. think, I think, I think, uh, I always, uh, I I love biophilic uh, uh, approach uh, because it's 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 uh, more uh, um, kind of emotional approach, uh, yeah. more related uh i always talk about this also so sure so. you do i, I know i yeah. know you do and then uh i think this is a i like it a lot because it, it really touched the 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 heart of the people 
right? Yeah. When we talk yeah. about yeah. our inter, uh, interrelation yeah. with the other species and yeah. how we need them and uh, uh, yeah. actually how we are, we are nature. <laughs> right. <You laughs> and are. people don't recognize this. And then, uh, so we, we are water, we are nature, we are uh, yeah. animals, we are a monkey that- We are animals, yeah, absolutely. More evoluted. Yeah. That we, we deny know that all, every day. Yeah. yeah. Very true. Yeah. Uh, any, any, any response from the questioner? Do you, uh, do you... Uh, Fabiano, uh, do you want to, do you want to open the, the, your mic? Your mic? Can, can we do this? Uh, um, uh, Rodrigo, pode abrir o, o já foi, já foi. Bye, Fabio. Oi, um, hi, hi, Tim. It's Fabiano speaking hi. here. Hi. No, thank you very much for for your talk and for the for your answer. Um, it it was really interesting to see. Uh, in a way, to me, it felt like uh, the biophilia concepts uh, that you uh, champion seems to be a framing that, hierarchically speaking, is above. You know? Uh, the potential more utilitarian framings that are more commonly used, at least in Europe, as, as, as you said. Yeah. Um, so, no, I, I, I appreciate your, your answer. And it, it, it's interesting also because, in my view, the history of planning uh, is a history of challenges. And nature has been used in many ways uh, as a way to resolve challenges across time. You know? So when we went through the Industrial Revolution, the challenge was air pollution, the challenge was congestion, the challenge was how to bring people close to uh, uh, green spaces in the countryside. And in many ways, this has been the case, depending on the different, well, the, with various different challenges, but it has been the case in the way planning has been uh, relating uh, to, the, to, to, to the question of nature. Um, so um, it, it, to me, I, I think, um, the, the whole relationship with um, nature is about domains uh, of how we actually engage with the environment. Um, and uh, and I, I thought that the, the more perhaps um, spiritual or more um, um, or the deeper meaning of nature that you, that you put forward was also, I think it's a reminder uh, to everyone yeah. on that front. Yeah, yeah. yeah there, will, there will be different things that reach different people but for me uh th there is a spiritual there's a there's an ethical there's uh you know there's there other things that are important I, I i often object and there's a lot of uh discussion uh you can make a little bit of fun of it even but this idea of nature is a pill you know that that we're uh i i think that's that's okay um you know sort of par parks rx or nature rx or we do you know we but i think again it it uh it's uh in some ways trivializes nature or it see, again sees nature as only some 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 tool or some means to uh to a very an anthropocentric you know and anyway good question what, what other what other questions do you want? I wish I could read them all, but uh, I don't know because we are short in time now. Two time, yeah. Do you is it a, a hard stop at seven? Is yes. that or? and it's like okay. well, yeah. I say in the beginning, I think we won't succeed to go through everything, and uh, maybe just the last one. And uh, yeah. we know we are part of a green conspiracy here in Brazil with Cecilia, like, like thirteen years, thirteen years, <laughs> and we are putting this kind of crazy idea in the head of everybody. Né? And a lot of yeah. questions about how. Né? And uh, I don't believe that there is like a manual on how to transform people, to transform cities. And, and I believe yeah. it starts from like small and, and think about, but maybe you have some some advice to, to give us for, for, for people listening to you now. Yeah. Points. Well, I. I think it's uh, doing doing whatever you can in, in whatever levers you have uh, at at your disposal. Uh, I know Cecilia, you you have a, no, a nonprofit, right? Or a, I mean, it, it, it's um, or a company or a small. Not you know, anymore. Can, not anymore. Okay. No. Well, I think it's looking around you 
and uh, it's doing little things. Absolutely, it's the example of Nina Marie Lister from Toronto. You know, what what powerful thing she did to to resist the the bylaw and to plant. You know, as a kind of guerrilla um, ta tactic, if you will. Um, and and there's so many things that we could be doing to start conversations like that, um, to, to do things around us in our neighborhoods or at work or. But then there are bigger political strategies. Um, you know, I think uh, at least in many cities, uh, a lot of wonderful things happen because there are coalitions of people. There are there's political support behind a mayor. Um, you know, who who champions a lot. A lot of things can happen from the top down if you have the right the right government in place. And I'm frequently asked, well, is it top down or is it bottom up or what? You know, yeah. some everything it's everything and every combination uh and and so doing what you can you know if it's possible to to, to become part of a campaign um you know we have yeah. a, a city council election going on here you know one of the candidates is talking about a, a stronger tree protection code you know you, you can you can literally really change the agenda by showing up at, at meetings so um so i think there's so many things like that that that, mm. that you, you could do, but each person will have a, maybe a different uh, set of opportunities, a different set of, of, of levers. If you're, if you're a company, if you're you know, doing, doing something, there, there, will, there will be a nature connection and a, and a, and a way to, to, to support these ideas, I think. So I don't know if that's... Maybe, that's maybe just be creative as nature is, né? To, to find a way to always like explore and transform and... and uh... yeah. I believe creativity in, in is the main is the main point. And Absolutely. I believe as creative nature is really a font of a, a source of inspiration, and, yes. and the way life gives birth to life all the time and fabrics habitat for life. And yes. let's let's look at how nature start to colonize in the in the in the in the great uh, in the good uh, meaning of colonizing right. you know, and, right. uh, and, and use that as as a tool. Yeah. Okay, and uh, um, I just want to say that uh, tell everybody that uh, we're gonna have next. Uh, what happened here? Uh, we're gonna have next. Uh, uh, Nina Marie will be here. Oh, she's coming. She's gonna be. She's okay. coming on oh. December second. <laughs> oh, She'll fantastic! Be here. And then uh, so uh, we have an, 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 a program, um, astonishing program. Next week we're gonna have David Maddox. Oh, so, wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. They're all our yeah. friends. Yeah. Yeah. They're all our friends. <laughs> yeah. We have, when we are in this uh, world, we make great friends. Right? That's true. That's very yeah. True. And so, um, so next week, we're going to have uh, the pleasure of having uh, 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 the founder of uh, The Nature of Cities, Nature of Cities. Uh, which is a platform. Da Pierre, estamos sem a imagem, não sei o que está acontecendo aí. Não. Ou eu que estou ruim. Eu, eu vou botar tá a ruim. imagem de todas as palestras que a gente está citando outras além do, do Dev. Ah, que eu não estou vendo, ah, eu não estou vendo, só estou vendo o birro. É, já vai, já vai, segura aí. Ah, tá. É, é, so next, uh, I'm going to speak in Portuguese. Uh, can you get the, the translation now, uh, uh, Tim? Tim? It is. Okay. Good translation. Can, can you have the translation? If I speak in Portuguese, eu, eu vou tentar. É, na, semana, é, então, na semana que vem temos David Maddox, que é o fundador da... da essa daqui é o nosso programa, o Pierre acabou de colocar aqui. É, no, na outra semana, eu errei, na, na, é, daqui 15 dias o Fabiano Lemes vai estar com a gente, que está aqui hoje. É uma honra tê-lo aqui. É, apresentando o seu trabalho, que é que eu também conheço, que é, aliás, eu conheço o trabalho de todos, não tinha convidado, né? Claro. É, o Oliver Hillel, que é da, do CBD, uh, também é um fera, né, que vai falar sobre biodiversidade urbana. É, depois vem Marc Barra, que é da, da Grande Paris. É, Lá da Nature Paris, então ele é da, da região da, de Paris, né? Ele é, responsável, é o ecólogo urbano responsável 
por toda a parte de biodiversidade dessa da, da cidade de Paris. Depois vem Jack Ahern, ele é o único que é na segunda-feira, porque eu errei o convite na data. né? Ele sempre me convida às quartas-feiras, e eu peguei, acho que o mês errado, na hora que eu estava fazendo o convite, e chamei ele para uma segunda-feira, e ele topou, eu não quis mexer, porque eu não posso perder o Jack Ahern, porque eu conheço o Pierre, inclusive, por causa de uma palestra que eu promovi, que foi a primeira palestra que eu promovi, em 2008, né? acho que foi em dezembro de 2008, em... lá no Parque Lage, na... no Salão Nobre, quando a gente tinha... Foi até por conta dessa palestra do Jack que a gente fundou o Em Verde, o PR também era parte do Em Verde, do Instituto Em Verde, que é essa ONG que o, que o Tim uh, se referiu. Então, na segunda-feira, dia 29 do 11, a gente vai ter o Jack Ahan, que é da Universidade de Massachusetts, e, para fechar, a Nina Marie Lister, porque precisava de uma mulher, né? Nessa Começou com uma mulher, com a Marta Farrado, e vai terminar com uma mulher, que é a Nina Marie. É, depois é que eu me dei conta que eu só tinha chamado o homem. <risos> eu falei, nossa, estou sendo muito, muito, muito machista. Né? Então, que feio, né? Normalmente a gente procura equalizar e tal, mas eu, conforme fui botando os nomes, foi surgindo vários homens e <risos> Ficou uma na abertura e uma no fechamento. E, é, é assim, é, acho que é uma vai ser muito legal vocês estarem aqui, né em todas elas. Lembrando que, para ter certificado, precisa fazer inscrição no site da, do CCE. Em cada palestra tem um link, é uma burocracia que é, faz parte da, do jogo, então vocês têm que entrar lá no, 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 no site lá do CCE e procurar a palestra da semana ou faz logo a inscrição para todas as palestras, e aí você já recebe o certificado, né? aqui você tem que dizer que está presente, tal, que eles passam as instruções, e, é, e aí a gente fecha o ano. Né? E, é, e também que tá, termina né, essa quarta turma da pós-graduação em paisagismo ecológico, planejamento do projeto da paisagem. É, fecha a parte das aulas é, na semana seguinte, né? e e aí é isso. É... Pierre, quer dar a última palavra? Eu vou passar para o Tim. Aliás, Tim, do you want to uh, uh, give your uh, some words, last words? You Sorry, can Cecilia, talk. Did you hear me? Uh, I just I didn't catch the last part of that, just to say goodbye. To, to... Yeah, you just, yeah. yeah, was la uh, yeah I just, was... yeah, no, thank you for the last uh, chance to just, uh, I, I wish I could be there in person. Um, Me too. Uh, I hope that uh, you all can find a, a, some ways to give meaning to this idea, find an expression, uh, find a city, work in your city, uh, but also uh, keep in touch if you're doing something that you think we should share with the other, with the rest of the world, please let us know. We'd love to hear from you. So please, please stay, stay in touch. Yeah, I but think you're you going to be listening. here when uh, Rio uh, uh, joins the network, right? Yeah, that would be wonderful if we, if, yeah. if it, yeah, I hope you, I hope you can come. Yeah. 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 That and would be great. I know that they, they were planning uh, something. Uh, uh for next year uh to okay. have some uh when we can gather all together right. when we can uh, yeah after we have this pandemic uh solved we will i think they, they are planning that's to solved. make some <laughs> yes so we can get together again that's uh, all hope hope for that yeah, yeah hope, hope for that, that. For, for, hope for that be uh soon uh early le le like next year i don't know when And this is going to be uh, really possible to put everybody together. We can uh, hug each other and uh, and <laughs> that would be wonderful, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, I miss it a lot. And uh, okay. I, uh, that's it. So, Pierre, Very good. Eu quero agradecer todo mundo. Quero agradecer os intérpretes. Agradecer a Amanda. Agradecer o Rodrigo. O apoio do CCE. E toda a turma da pós-graduação que está aqui também, né? obviamente. E uh, todo mundo a mais, né? Nossos, nossas outras pessoas estão é, sempre com a gente, os novos. Enfim, é muito legal. Muito legal estar tá aqui, assim, super estimulante. Principalmente que eu estou no Brasil, não estou à meia-noite. 
E quando eu estou fora do Brasil, realmente é que eu não sei, é, o Fabiano está lá na Itália, né? Não é mole, né? E eu estou voltando para aí é, no, dia, no final de, de novembro. Então, vou pegar o final, as duas últimas já vou pegar aí em Lisboa. Então, aproveitar enquanto eu estou num horário decente para é, participar. É isso, gente. Pierre. Thanks a lot, team. Thanks for everything. Great, 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 great lessons. And uh, I think I will look at it again because there were so many ideas, so many examples. Really nice. It's going to be on our channel on YouTube. E obrigado a todo mundo, principalmente hoje, o apoio da, da, da tradução do, do, da Soraya e do André, né, que fez um grande trabalho para poder trazer para todo mundo em português os conceitos da série biofílica. É, os alunos, os outros colegas aí de nossa grande conspiração verde, né, Henrique, Fabiano, é, estamos muitos aqui trabalhando, Andréia também, que eu estou vendo que escreveu um livro de costura verde há um certo tempo já, que está conosco, e Renata também, que eu conheço de outras lutas, todo mundo aqui, muito obrigado pela participação de todos. Vamos ainda ter muitos encontros da nossa grande conspiração verde. Contamos com todos aí para a gente transformar e virar esse mundo, devolver ele para outras espécies além do ser humano. Tá bem? Bom fim de dia. Obrigado a todos e até quarta que vem. Tchau, tchau.